Hello again, 201. In this video, I will go over the second part of Chapter 12 of South Asia, the economics and the geopolitical topics of this region. And agriculture has been the big change in the subcontinent in the last 50 years. Historically, farmers did not have much social status, and there was a very unequal distribution of farmland. And tenant farming was quite common. And that was a legacy of the colonial era of export-oriented farming. But with the scientific inventions of the 1970s, the Green Revolution reduced and reversed historic trends by increasing production that actually met this population growth that's been going on in South Asia. But the problem is it uses a lot of fertilizers and pesticides. And the cultivation of hybrid crop strains helps to aid production, but the costs to the environment are very, very severe. The groundwater tends to become polluted. Different crop zones, there are three primary subsistence crops, rice, wheat, and millet. And there's also sesame grown, peanuts, coconuts, spices, and tea. And here are the regions where those different crops are grown. Livestock, meat consumption is very low. We discussed that in the other video. Religion is the reason why. Cattle are sacred in the Hindu faith. But there has been some increase in milk production. Dwarf plants through cross-pollinization techniques help to produce this green revolution. And the Punjab became the region's breadbasket. And there are also Green Revolution rice strains that succeeded in meeting this huge population. And again, here are the economic or environmental problems that result from the planting of these types of crops and the use of these different chemicals. Prosperous farmers can afford to buy all of this new technology and the poorer farmers go into debt in an attempt to keep up and many lose their land after failing to pay loans. And can they continue this meeting of supply with demand in food? At present, they are successful in doing this, but are they poisoning themselves as a result? Will the groundwater levels in the Punjab stop falling? Can they reduce the waste problems? Globalization is a big phenomenon in South Asia. Many of you have probably talked to telemarketers at some point that were based in India. After independence, they were largely a socialist country until the 80s to where growth was barely above population growth. And in the 90s, they went towards neoliberalist policies, as did China and Thailand in that same relative time period. A lot of regulation was eliminated. The economy was open to imports. They sought capital for investment. And as in many world regions facing globalization, gradual internationalization has generated substantial opposition, usually from entrenched interests. This is something that goes on in all of these different regions we talk about in this course. Competition establishes or it challenges the status quo or those who have already been in that market. And cheap manufactured goods from China are a serious threat to any sort of goods produced in India. Farming is not really competitive and they eased back on further plans for agricultural liberalization. There isn't a lot of direct foreign investment as compared to China and their infrastructure is a problem in India. And that's why they lead ex experts, leading experts say that India is not going to match the economic growth of China long term until this issue is addressed. When I first started teaching this course six years ago, there were some serious labor problems in Bangladesh with garment workers, which was a big industry here in the CNMI not too long ago. And there was a fire that killed garment workers in Bangladesh because they were locked in these factories. At the time, they were only making 19 cents an hour. Since this time, 
there has been some reforms and wages have increased to a more livable wage still nowhere near what they should be i don't even think they're to a dollar an hour yet but they are much much higher than 19 cents now geopolitical concerns we've talked about some of that briefly already in the previous video with the political and ethnic conflicts that have gone on in the Kashmir between Pakistan and India and also in the island off the coast of the peninsula there have been ethnic problems in Sri Lanka as well. Puspa Bishnet was also another interesting story from years ago. She provided daycare to the children of incarcerated or jailed parents. And many Nepalese, there are some here on Saipan, they seek work in India or other places because their average wage as of 2012 was only $750 a year. That's not a lot of money. Other places in South Asia, there are good charts in the textbook to show you the different types of problems that resulted from the partitioning. Gandhi tried to stop this from happening, but he was not successful. And in the migrations then that went on between the newly created country of Pakistan, which was split, East Pakistan is Bangladesh today, and then there's West Pakistan, which is up in the Kashmir region. People migrated from one region out of India or from that region into India, and when all these people were passing, it erupted into bloodshed. And there's been bad blood between these countries ever since. And during British India, the Kashmir was a Muslim country joined to a Hindu district ruled by a Maharaja who was a king that was subject to British advice. And, but it was peaceful at that time. And historically, the East India Company dominated the subcontinent from the 18th century until the middle of the 19th century when it was made a direct crown colony after the Sepoy Rebellion, where troops objected to having to use the new Enfield rifles because they had to use pork to grease the cartridges, the bullets. And that's an unclean animal to both Hindus and Muslims. And that's when the British Imperial Army moved in there directly, and then they took the country over and made it a direct colony instead of just allowing this commerce firm to run things indirectly. And there are some possible solutions to what to do about the Kashmir. Some want to keep it the way it is. Neither accept the control of the other. Some Kashmiris seek union with Pakistan. Moderates want to work within the Indian democracy, but they risk assassination then for associating with the Hindu controlling government and then on the other side you have hindu militants and extreme nationalists who want to keep this part of india forever in 2001 many of you are familiar with this story already pakistan developed closer ties with the u.s because of the war in afghanistan against the taliban sri lanka there were problems between hindu tamils who are dominant in the north of the island, and but the majority group historically has been Buddhist and they speak a different language. And they would like to see this become a Buddhist state. And the government has favored the majority. But the Tamils attacked the Sri Lankan army and they were in conflict for quite a few years in this century. And it's been relatively calm in recent years, but just a decade ago, these two different ethnic groups were at war with one another on this island. And those are the main geopolitical concerns going on there. There's also problems historically between India and China up in the Tibetan region. And, but that has been calm since the early 1960s. And that concludes chapter 12.